Hello and welcome to the UN Versations, a platform where we'll be venturing into the heart of the United Nations in Rwanda. I am Imi Molekatete, your host today, and our first ever episode is with Maxwell Gomera. He just finalized his tour in Rwanda as the UNDP resident representative. Maxwell Gomera, how do you feel about the last three years in Rwanda and it's time for you to pack up and leave? First, thank you, Imi, for having me here. I appreciate the opportunity to be the first one to talk about the conversations about the UN. I think this is a critical uh, subject that we ought to have so that those we work with understand better who we are, what we stand for, and how we can be a partner of choice. So thank you. Pleasure. You know, when we started as a team, when we started uh, this journey some three years ago, mm. we decided that our narrative about development is going to be a narrative of hope, a narrative about the future, and a narrative about doing it together. And to this extent, I must give credit to my predecessor, Stephen mm -hmm. Rodriguez. I think he did a fantastic job in positioning the United Nations Development Program across uh, the partners who we work with and up and down this country. So in many ways, when I took over, um, Stephen had laid the ground mm -hmm. for us to be a more effective partner. What we needed to do at the time was to think about how do we play our development game within the three perspectives that I have explained. How do we have a narrative of development that is about the future? How do we have a narrative of development that, is, that creates hope in the people that we work with? And how do we have a narrative that brings everybody to the table? Mm. Now, talking about the future, one of the things we had to think about was Rwanda was already working on making sure that the critical assets that, the, that Rwanda has got mm. can be deployed as best they can to help the people of Rwanda. Rwanda was already working on environment. Yeah. We were already working on industrial development. We were already working on how we could develop an entrepreneurial capacity here. But what we did bring to the table was sharper focus mm. on how that development could be greener, could be sustainable, mm. and could be inclusive of everybody. What are some of the things, um, based on what you've talked about, that you feel like you're going to transition into your new role as um, you leave Rwanda? One, uh, there are two things that I found worked well for me here. The first one was to listen and learn okay. from the people and government of Rwanda. Unless you understand better mm. what people are, uh, um, are, the pain points that people have got, you won't be able to, to, to help them. Now, some of these things that I used to do might, might appear mundane at the moment, but every Saturday I would get on the road and run into Nyamirambo. Part of it was me trying to be fit, but a whole part of it was me trying to see how people live in Yamirambo mm. so I could understand better how to help them yeah. to move towards their dreams. Mm. And those things helped me. In the first three months of my existence here, I had been to the four corners of this country. Mm. Just to get to understand, I had sat down with many ministers, I had sat down with decision makers and listened and learnt from what their aspirations are. So that's one thing that I will take with me to South Africa. The second thing that I will take with me to South Africa is that you cannot do this as an individual. Mm. This is a collective act. Yeah. And we invested a lot in making sure that at UNDP, we've got one of the best and winning teams. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how to invest in giving my staff belief, in giving my staff the tools and capabilities that they need to be as best as they can in what they are doing. Great lessons. And I mean, it also reminds us how it's important to always go to the roots, because in any case, that's where we get to know what are some of the issues people um, are, are struggling with. You talked about Nyamijos, and I remember you, you used to say certain words like, 
Hahiye. Uh, what are some of the random words or, or certain cultures or things that you're going to take with you? You know, uh, language, you know, is an important tool yeah. for um, being a member of a cultural society. Unless you understand the language, you may not understand some of the cultural nuances mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. use. I found out people accepted me better in their, in their midst if I understood their um, language mm -hmm. and culture. Yeah. So I picked up some of the words, ha hi, mm -hmm. hari ha hi, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, that means lit. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, every time I would say, you know what, this is lit, and I would just use some of yeah, those words. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, instead of saying uh, yeah. you know, you would think mm -hmm. you know, the things like that. You know, I, I, I managed, I think, to integrate very well with language. Yeah. But also the way people do things. Um, the first person to invite me into their home was my driver. I really enjoyed mm. uh, first meeting her whole family. Uh, it was a woman. Um, but I also enjoyed understanding what foods people like here, yeah. why they like them, and where that is coming from. Mm. Were you heading to Nyamejos when, when you were on a motor recently? Because I realized you got banned. I How did was that get banned. Like? I did get banned. It was painful, <laughs> but it was exciting. No, I was actually coming from Kimi. Uh, you see, this is the other thing. We call it Kimi, but it's Kimi Urura. Mm -hmm. um, I was coming from Kimi and, uh, and I, it occurred to me, I run to the gym every morning and I run back from the gym. And it occurred to me that, hey, I've missed out mm. on uh, the transportation system that people use here. And I wanted to try it. And yes, I got to try it. Did you but say it was your first time to be on a motor? That was my first time to be on a motor. Mm -hmm. uh, because in Southern Africa, we don't use motorbikes as uh, forms of uh, public transport. Mm -hmm. um, so I did get on a motor, but what the note that I didn't get was <laughs> when you're jumping off a motor, try to avoid the exhaust because it's got some heat. Yeah. Um, and as a rookie, this is a rookie mistake, I must say, uh, I did, uh, you know, use the, the um, exhaust as a step, stepping. Mm -hmm and i paid the price yeah will you take a moto ever again i will uh-huh i loved it okay that's very good. i loved it and you know this is this is the, in the interesting thing about uh, rwanda it doesn't matter who you are people and how you look and where you're coming from you know the 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 women men they all jump on a moto and it's a normal thing it's like breathing really i mean nobody thinks about it mm. max the way you talk about each aspect of your story in Rwanda only emphasizes how you've been talking about storytelling as an art and as a way of um, inspiring change, uh, fostering some sort of behavioral change. What do you feel about storytelling and probably talk to any other person who may need to learn so much from it. Why is storytelling important and what impact does it have on development and how we contribute to it? You know, Amy, our stories shape our world. Yeah. Yeah? The words we use begin to shape our world, our aspirations, and what we prioritize in our world. Yeah? And many of us in the development world get consumed in words that we only we understand. Mm. And we pump a lot of wording and reports mm. onto society and hope that society will understand. In the climate change world, we believe that the dire state of the world will somehow prompt people into action. But that doesn't happen. What that does, it frustrates people. Yeah. And it makes them feel that they can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But when you start picking on aspects of climate change and making them dinner time stories, mm -hmm. then it will inspire people yeah. to act. Yeah. It will inspire young children to say to their parents, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. It will give us outrage when we understand that there are people in rural Rwanda right yeah. now who may not be having a full meal. 
when that becomes part of our story, it shapes society. Yeah. Because stories are what shape our society. Not so much the science that we know, not so much the technical abilities mm. that we have, mm. is the stories that we tell. Mm. And as a collective, we must learn to shape our story, agree on our story, and share those stories. Mm. Here is a country that came out of tragedy in 1994. Yeah. Years later, yeah. the people of this country have refused yeah. to let their history define them. The people of this country have shown us that you can be knocked down by someone and you'd be right to blame them for knocking you down. But you cannot be right in continuing to blame them for knocking you down because staying down is your choice. Yeah. This country decided to raise, rise from the ashes and rebuild a nation that we are all proud of today. Thank you very much, Max. That's, that's very powerful. And I believe that that's more or less what every Rwandan from wherever they are um, always choose to stand on. Um, so what would be your last word uh, to the staff to your fellow uh, UN country team that um, is going to stay, to probably even the new guy or girl that is coming in as the resident trip, and to Rwandans in general? The, uh, I would give two or three pieces of uh, advice yeah. from my own journey that I think um, I would love for staff here, but for Rwandans and for, for, for any leadership mm. to take into account. The first one is continue being curious about the world around you. Mm. Yeah. Continue wanting to see change that amplifies prospects for the next person. Mm. We can only do that if we are curious. Because the world is not the status quo. Mm. And policies and choices matter. Unless we change the policies and choices that other people made before us, we will not be able to change the prospects for ourselves, for our children, and for those who are coming mm. uh, to us. That starts with being curious. The second thing is kindness. Yeah. This world is running short of kindness. You just have to open the newspapers today and you see how many people are suffering, dying, or in one form of tragedy or another. A lot of that is because we need to rediscover our kindness. We need to rediscover that we are one human family mm. and when we get together to shape the world that we want, the prospects for our success will be amplified. That is something that we have lost. The third thing is advice I would like to give to us as Africans. Yeah. Um, for far too long, Africa has been lagging behind other, uh, other nations. A lot of it is because of our history, but part of it is because of the choices that we as Africans need to make. Now, other people in our history are, all, are making it difficult. Let me be clear here. The perceptions about Africa, the perceptions of risk about Africa are mostly unwarranted. And there are people who continue to peddle those perceptions. And, and that must stop and we must counter that at every opportunity. But Africa has the critical mass. We have the critical mass to change the prospects for what can be African. We must make it impossible for any investor. We must make it ridiculous for any investor to choose an investment destination other than Africa. Yeah. And to do so, we must make sure that our governance systems are top-notch, predictable, mm. and that we've got the critical human resources that industry needs to be able to pull in a particular direction, one direction or the other. These are things that we can do. And Africa, because we have now, very soon we will have the largest working age population. Let's take advantage of that. Yeah. That is something that is within us. Let's invest in our people, make sure they are educated. Let's invest in our systems. 
make sure they are predictable. Mm. But let's also change the narrative that we are seeing out there about Africa. So there you are. I see an Africa that's so beautiful. And I think that it's in our hands to build it. And I want to be part of that story. Yeah. And that wraps up our conversation. Thank you very much, Max, for your time. Yeah. And thank you all also for following that dialogue. Stay tuned for more of that, where we continue to learn, explore, and connect. Until next time, my name is Imi Molekatete, signing off.